just had a day sort of working on new tracks and stuff like that. Sounding good. So it's a, it's a good day when the music's not sounding like a load of shit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so. uh, I'll drink to that, man. Very awesome to hear. Yeah. Uh, Asimfell is a very interesting band name. Uh, it's very intriguing. What does that even mean, Asimfell? Yeah, it's a weird one. It doesn't really mean anything, um, which is a shame. I'm sorry to disappoint you. you. You probably think that there'd be some sort of cool explanation, but um, it's my uncle who started the band. He's no longer with us, so I took over when he when he passed. Um, he started the band back in like 1993. He was looking through um, a like witchcraft book or some kind of weirdo book, you know, and um, he he noticed the word Asomuel in the book. And I think he was drunk or whatever, and he wrote, he wrote it down as Asimvel. <laughs> he thought, oh, that's cool, you know, I'll uh, I'll use that. And when he woke up the next morning, yeah, he, he realized the mistake. But um, yeah, so the whole the whole band name was just one big mistake, really. <laughs> and then what followed that was just a uh, you know thirty years of mistakes, which led us to this point. You know, here we are. Yeah. Uh, very exciting. We got a new release in March. Um... Uh, I'd love to know what was your introduction to the bass? Was it your uncle? Yeah, it's it's strange because I always sort of looked up to my uncle and and saw him as, you know, the fucking king of rock and roll, second to Elvis, of course. And um, and it was my my old man as well is also in the band Lenny on, on guitar. So between the two of them, I had a lot of inspiration there to just kind of um, draw from. Uh, but it was it was actually Lenny, my my old man, who um, you know, sort of showed me the ropes because I guess he was around the house more. Um, but, you know, the two of them were always upstairs in the loft, um, you know, playing music. And we had a little little loft that they turned into like a rehearsal room. Um, and, well, dash, like bar, special brew, drinking zone. So, yeah, that was um, that was kind of where I got it from was, you know, most, most of it from my dad. But, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's in there. It's really cool because I feel like a lot of band members can't say some of their biggest inspirations are the band they're in. <laughs> mm. But I feel like it's it's a really cool situation you're in. Um, I'd love to know what some of your outside influences are. Do you pull more from like British New Wave or Thrash? Um, I would say, I mean, I remember when I, when I was growing up, sort of around 15 years old, I started like going to the gym and and kind of using like Aston Bell as like motivational kind of music, you know, uh, great sort of lyrics and like words to live by, I suppose. And um, so really, since that was like my favorite band, any, any band that sounded a, a bit like Aston Bell, or I should say sounded like us, or sounded like them, which is now us, um, that was, uh, you know, sort of like Motorhead, ACDC, Status Quo. Uh, I, I was always brought up listening to things like Slade, Stuff like that, you know, anything that's got kind of like a, I suppose it's more rock and roll than it is metal. Do you know what I mean? Like um, the kind of more, the more blues inspired stuff has, has always been more prominent. I don't know why. I guess it's just what I've been been raised on. You know. Yeah, nothing wrong with that, man. Uh, I'd love to know what was like the defining moment you realized you wanted to like help continue the band's legacy. Yeah, it, it's. It was a it was a strange moment where um, there was a there was another uh, bassist and vocalist between my uncle and, and me joining the band. They had a, a guy in the band for a while, and and stuff wasn't working out, and so they, they sort of parted ways. And and so Aston Bell was left with essentially it was just Lenny, you know, and and sort of thinking how are we going to move forward. And at that point, I was in um, in a band called Stone Cold Kill that we, that we'd started a, as kind of a an Aston Bell wannabe band, you know, <laughs> just, oh, these guys are great. Fucking hell. Like let's, let's write songs like that. And um, I think it it was a gig that we had um, that my dad was at and, and he sort of saw me on stage for the first time in a while, you know, and I think at that age I was improving like quite a lot, quite quick. And, and yeah, he, he says that he was, he was impressed by, you know, how I was doing with Stone Cold Kill and I, I think it was, yeah, it might have been him that asked. I can't remember if it was him asking or me offering, but it felt like it was almost like at the same time, just like, like, are you thinking what I'm thinking kind of moment? And then kind of going, yeah, but this is kind of stupid as well, because I was like, <laughs> like 17 at the time. So you've got like a 17 year old and a fucking 
someone who's old enough to be my dad because he is my dad, <laughs> you know? And it's like, is this age difference going to work, <laughs> you know? But, you know, you see us on stage and we're all bounding around like we're, like we're 15 years old. So it's, it is working, you know? I feel like it, it definitely works, man. And especially like, uh, what are you in like your late twenties? Yeah. 27 now. I'm, okay, I'm, 20, now. I'm 25. So I feel like, right. uh, we both have that social media edge where we yeah. also understand like what a band needs to bring to the table or just anything really, even like what I'm yeah. doing here. Exactly. Um, it's, it's so I think it just definitely, band, is it? exactly. You know, the, yeah. The whole world takes place on, on like a great degree of the whole world takes place on social media. And, and that went from, you know, Facebook being this thing where you'd like connect with your friends to now where it's like, you connect with people you don't know and, and everyone is it's gone from people's profiles being like, you know, just posting stuff for their friends to see to like everyone's a, a mini influencer trying to, you know, build this kind of bullshit version of themselves. And, and like just so much of the world is online right now. And it's like that ain't going away. I mean, COVID just accelerated that um, and kind of put the final nail in the coffin. So, yeah, it's good to have you got the the old school rock sound with, you know, the kind of new school way of doing it, which is good. Yeah, totally. And and to bring it back to British new wave of heavy heavy metal, I totally like hear an influence in there. Um, how important is that genre to you? Yeah, we were just playing. Um, we were just playing Saxon downstairs. Actually, uh, yeah. Strange, Strangers in the Night. We were like, should we do a cover of this for the album? And then we were like, no, oh, maybe, maybe not. But it was, um, you know, that, that sort of music. Like I say, I was sort of raised on, on that kind of stuff, and Lenny in particular. Um, he draws from that a lot just in terms of like the, the guitar style, you know. So it it's in there uh, alongside a lot of the more, like I say, like the more bluesy stuff, you know. Um, and then you've got Ryan on the drums who he's into like a lot more um, like bands with logos that I can't even read, you know, <laughs> like that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, so there's, there's all sorts of influences going in now that, are, you know, they get thrown into the pot and then we sort of weed out naturally it feels like we were just weeding out the bad ideas because we've got we've got plenty of them and uh, arrive at something that sounds like us you know very cool to hear now when you first joined the band and you started writing for the first time how did it feel officially contributing to the writing of this band after so long of just like listening to them and like being a fan yeah it was the, just about the coolest thing ever you know like imagine you, you i don't know what, what's your favorite band uh, Black Sabbath. Imagine you get to step <laughs> up and start writing lyrics for Black Sabbath. Like that's how it felt, you know, as a kid when you when you fucking idolize a band. Um, you know, it's like, and, and like I say, it's part of your daily fucking life is going to the gym and listening to these songs, and they're getting you through like some shit times, you know. And then you get to. I, I remember the the first album that that we wrote when I joined the band. There was a load of um, my Uncle Jay's lyrics that they'd found after he passed. They found like under his bed or something like that. A load of unused lyrics. So we tried to like use a load of them uh, just as sort of like a tribute, you know, and sort of using them and then putting my own lyrics in to maybe do another verse that were kind of uh, tallied with that. And that was just a great experience, you know. Uh, I mean, even still to this day, like um, we were just doing a demo downstairs for a, a song called Stare at Death and Spit which is um, like a tribute to my uncle Jay. And we were sort of, um, there's, a, there's actually an old Assenbell song where Jay says the words, stare at death and spit. So like I ripped the audio from that and like put it into the, onto the demo, you know, just to see how it, how it would work and sort of matched up my voice with that, doing like wow. a duet, you know? And it's like, this is just cool as fuck. Like it just feels right, you know? Um, and it's, it's a fucking, a privilege to do it i just i feel like um like it's meant to be you know like for you know even though it's such a tragedy that happened like it feels like well at least we've kind of come through it you know and done something meaningful you know it feels good that must feel amazing man and that's really really cool to learn um now world shaker is a great record you guys put out and you guys got signed to heavy psych sounds uh, yeah that's for right. that album how do you get signed to that label I don't remember. 
<laughs> blocked that whole period out, you know. Um, I think it would have, I think, you know, we, we, we had a few videos that we were putting out on Facebook when that was like the, still like the best way to promote. Um, and we had like a, I think we've done a video for World Shaker before World Shaker actually came out. Um, and that video kind of blew up. So I think he probably saw that and I think emailed us on, on the back of that and was like, oh, are you guys interested in an album deal or whatever? But, you know, it's it's interesting going through that and realizing that there's not a lot there that we, at this point, like that we've arrived at now, that we can't kind of do ourselves. Um, so this next album we're putting out, we're just doing it on our own, you know, and we'll, we'll see how that goes. But it's looking great so far. You know, we've kind of got that freedom to, you know, I remember when we did World Shaker, we recorded it in like 20, the, the back end of 2018 uh, or, or like the middle of 2018. We didn't end up putting it out till like a year, a year and a half later um, because of, you know, the record company's release schedule and stuff like that. And it just felt like we've got this music. We want to put it out, you know, and it's just a, there's a lot we can do now with, with social media and stuff like that. And like a relentless, totally. a relentless touring schedule that, that we we got planned for when this album comes out, where it's like, you know, and then you do that tour and you document it for social media. So it's just a snowball effect that, you know, we're seeing every day, like the, the numbers are going up and that those fan engagements are, are getting stronger. And it's just like, it, it feels good to just be independent, you know, and not, and not be waiting for that kind of big thumbs up from Papa. Yeah. Come on guys. You welcome up you, to the big leagues. Now it's like, now we'll fucking do it ourselves. You know, it, it feels empowering, you know, definitely. And I feel like we've reached like a new era of, of making music where you don't need a label anymore, which is like good riddance, honestly, because yeah. you hear about those stories with Raven and Jaguar where they only had like three days to record their album in the studio. They got like a shit budget. Um, now it's like you can have your own setup. You can do it at your own pace, uh, which is how music should be made. Yeah. It, I mean, we've experienced that just this week, actually, because I, I finally got um, got the setup just a little bit more refined for how we're like, recording the demos and stuff in, our, in the studio we've got, um, which, you know, we're not fucking producers. We, we're not great at, at that kind of thing. We can record, but we can't mix and produce, really. Um, but we've been doing these social media videos where we do like a live recording into like a, into the desk and then we, you know, oh, turn the bass up, turn the guitar up. Like, so you kind of learn, you know, the kind of monkey side of it that way. And, and so we just got a little bit better at doing these demos and, and that kind of thing. And we're just putting on a track and going, okay, well, ah, try that again, but maybe take, the, let me take the vocals off and just do like, just put the guitar on. You know, don't worry about the vocals. Just put the guitar on and let's see what, what we can do. And we kind of got that freedom there instead of having a producer like, oh, come on, guys, you should have had this worked out. Um, well, it's like, well, this is us working it out now in, a, in an environment that just feels like, you know, quite creatively free. You know, we, we have the idea, we put it down, we see if it works. And it's all at our own pace. You know, that, that's really, it's really seeming like it's getting good results so far. So it's good. And as a fan, that's amazing to hear because I feel like there were so many bands back in the day, especially metal bands, where they had the label over their shoulder telling them, hey, you should yeah. sound more like this or you should go more in this direction. So you guys, it's just purely how you want to sound, which is so, so amazing to hear and, and a nice breath of fresh air. Yeah, we had that um, before with a, there was a label um, down in London, Bad Omen Records, I think for the for the Knuckle Lister album, I think. At one point, there was a, a brief conversation around like, well, would you want to change the band name or or the band logo or some, something like that? Because I get it, like Assam Bell isn't very marketable, right? Um, but they said that about like, you know, Schwarzenegger, you know, having such a long, you know, Schwarzenegger fucking name on a, on a movie poster. Like it's just people, aren't, it's not going to be a household name. And sure enough, you know, if you've got that kind of belief and you've got that vision, then then you shouldn't listen to these people that they want to try and change you. And, you know, especially when it, when it comes down to like the sound of, of, of your band, you know, you just got to tell those people to fuck off. And I think that's now we're in a position where we can tell them to fuck off. It's like, Oh, brilliant. There's nothing better than being able to tell people to fuck <laughs> off. You know, it's absolutely amazing. 
hundred percent. And uh, there's this death metal band called uh, Sang Sis Bong or something. It's it's some name with like twenty letters, and they're doing great. So really, the mu- let, let the music do the talking. You know, it's just ridiculous how people are trying to control a band's image and and looks and everything. Uh, now I'm just curious. Do you remember the first live show you did with the band? And I was asked this a couple of weeks ago. And I, oh, really? I, even <laughs> since being asked asked that and not remembering it, I still don't remember it or even where it was. I think it was in London. It was like a maybe a packed out 200 capacity venue in London, I, I think, something like that. I don't really remember how it went, but um, I think compared to like, Compared to how we are now, I I look on stuff that we did like a year ago and I'm like, you know, it's probably a good thing that I, I judge it relatively poorly, at least compared to how we're doing now. I'm just like, you know, especially now with, with the lineup change where we've got my brother on guitar as well. It's just kind of like, this is a different band. I almost feel like when, when people say things like, oh, I saw you guys in 2016, you guys rock. I'm like, no, we didn't. <laughs> I mean, even you, you just said like, oh, World Shake is a great album, and I and I thought no, it isn't because I know what's coming, you know. So I mean, that's a, that's a good thing, I suppose. But no, I don't really remember what the what the first gig was. Um, hate to disappoint you, but I I can't remember. It's, it's brain- it, whatever, man. It's yeah, it, it's a long time ago, and I feel like uh, the first show or whatever as a band or an artist or whatever is usually the hardest to remember because it's like. You usually just black out mentally because it's just such a crazy new experience, especially with everything, your relationship with the band before that time. You yeah, know? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of expectation to, to kind of deliver, not not from and that's that's the weird thing is there's no real expectations from the fans because, you know, up until a few years ago, the fan base was relatively small, you know, and, and they're going to support us just because they just because they appreciate the sentiment. I mean, even if I if I rocked up at that first gig and was absolutely diabolical, it's like, oh, isn't that cute? You know? <laughs> so um we're at the point where I think I think now we've got the kind of fan base where there's a there's a serious standard that, that needs to be met. But just just that expectation from like from like myself, because I know what's gone before. I know that I know the attitude and and the kind of charisma that that has gone before. I'm like, I can never fucking hope to meet that. Because I fucking idolized the guy, you know, um, but but just to stand in those shoes and and kind of do my own thing and kind of find my own way with it, as, and, and I feel like we're finally at the point now where I can proudly say that I've kind of found my own fucking thing with it, you know. I guess that's that's what comes with age and and experience and stuff like that. So it feels good, you know. Very very exciting to hear, man. Uh... You probably don't remember, or you probably you must remember the the Tokyo gig you did, mm. which is so cool. Um, I saw the whole behind the scenes video you yeah. put out on like doing the music video and like shouting shit. Yeah, that walking was great. down the street. Uh, how do you how do you reflect on that gig? That whole thing was just a whirlwind, man. We were we landed at the airport. We were you know taken straight to the hotel, and it, it was late at night. And I think we had the gig like the next the next night so we had this this one night that, like a free time that we're like let's go and fucking film this music video you know we had the the little camera and the and like the steady cam gimbal that our, our manager was was using um and so we i'd been i'd actually been playing um well i think you would have seen on that video i've been playing this video game like a few few weeks before that had the whole same fucking street layout and everything so i knew where we were going and i'm like right let's fucking go <laughs> you know, I've got all the shots in my head of what we want to get. Let's go and do it. And as a result, it, it's kind of weird because it, it's like we documented that whole thing. So in that way, it feels more like, oh, there's like the souvenir of, of us in Tokyo. But as far as personal experience goes, it's like we were so busy to to really like experience it as much as we, we kind of wanted to, you know. So it's it's on my bucket list to to go back even in like a non-musical capacity, just because the place was just so fucking great. And I, it's somewhere I'd always wanted to go, but it was just like, go, 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 you know, the whole time, just fucking insane. It's an absolute blur, but... What know, was it, 48 we, hours? Yeah, 48 hours and straight back, you know, so I think we had uh, sort of two nights and we were leaving like early in the morning the next day, you know, after the gig. 
and the gig itself was just unbelievable. Um, it's very rare that you have a gig where, where nothing goes wrong. And I think, if I remember, <laughs> that was one of those gigs where nothing went wrong. And it's wow. just like, you know, you come out and, and straight away, it's like, oh, the audience is like on our side, which is kind of like 50-50 for us because a lot of the time we'll be in a support slot or we'll be on a festival slot just kind of somewhere in the middle and we're not sure if the audience, you know, a lot of the times, like because of the the way that we push ourselves on social media with like the, the short videos and stuff like that, there's a lot of like, oh, who the fuck are these guys? These fucking, this fucking Lemmy rip off bullshit band, you know? And and they don't know the the fucking actual story behind the band or why we're the way we are or, or what our fucking mission is or how we are in fact our own thing entirely, based on that alone, you know? And so they. Um, there'll be people there at certain gigs that you kind of have to win over or, or just, you know, blow them to smithereens one way or the other, um, whether they like it or not. But that was just one of those gigs where it just felt like, I don't know if it's because we're from the UK and they they maybe don't get a lot of UK bands over there. So it's, it's just exciting, you know, but there was just excitement and it's great when you get a gig like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Really cool to hear, man. And, and that is bullshit. The people who will just like, you know, motorhead rip off or whatever. And I saw, I think you even said somewhere that someone like called you like an industry plant, which is fucking like ridiculous. Yeah. Fucking hell. What was that? <laughs> oh, this was, you know, it, it's, it's something that again, I can kind of see why people jump to that conclusion because we're a band that, you know, you, a lot of people are only just seeing for the first time. We've got, we've got a studio there that we've spent like the last five years you know, kind of saving up for to fucking make this thing happen and putting all the fucking soundproofing in and getting it all to the level that it's at. And we've got marshals that have been acquired over the band's 30 year long career. Um, and so, but, but anyone who's just like walking in and going like, oh, who's this? And it's like, oh, look at these privileged twats. You know, they don't see the hard work that's gone into that. So it's like, if you have something, it must have been given to you. And it, in you know, in the case of this band, it's like the, the amount of fucking hardships we've had to overcome and that we have to overcome just to keep fucking going. You know, it's like, it, it's quite easy for people on, on social media to just see that one video where none of that is shown or mentioned or alluded to. They're just going to think, oh, look at these privileged cunts. I don't have that. They do. You know, fuck them. So I, I see yeah. where it comes from, you know, but that's just something that people people will see over time that you know they'll see our character and and and, and who we are as people because we're not going away you know so yeah it definitely things. it definitely is the price of like working an algorithm you know because you get kind of everybody and then the people yeah. who stick will become the fans so you kind of are going through this filter of like and just seeing how people react so of course you're going to get yeah. like heads you know what i mean which sucks and it's kind of just a part of the game at this point, unfortunately. Yeah, um, I saw some, I saw, I saw a video um, just this morning, actually. It said something like, um, how to make sure your video goes viral every time. And I thought, some people want that. You want to have like 200,000 comments of people that have no fucking idea about what they're commenting on. Just talking like pure bullshit, you know? Because that's the thing. So many people in these like TikTok comment sections and stuff these days, it, it's like some form of, a friend of mine um, called it "well actually ism." It's like they always have some kind of "well actually." No, you're doing it wrong. Oh well, actually, it's this way. Or like you know, you'll be feeding your dog, and someone will say that you're giving them the wrong dog food, or you shouldn't feed them at that time of day, or you're using the wrong bowl for the dog food, or there'll be some kind of way in which you, you're doing it wrong, and and people in the comment section just have to point it out, and and we find ourselves. Um, I, I think the video we put up yesterday, I, I'm like winding up a uh, cable for some headphones. And I, I said to Stell as I was doing it, I said, oh, people have got to comment on this and say that I'm winding it up the wrong way. You know, because it, and it's just one of those things that you just kind of, you know, if anything, just lean into it, you know, because engagement is, is engagement, whichever way you slice it. Um, but I, I don't think it's like desirable to go fucking viral every single time. And uh, nor is it healthy because I mean, we try and reply to just about every comment that we get because a lot of the time it's, you know, genuine fans that we feel we owe them the fucking world. 
But of course, you, you have a lot of comments if, if something goes viral from people that, you know, are far from fans. You know, even though they're exhibiting all the, all the fan behavior of engaging with your posts, like, you know, they're fucking haters. And so, you know, it's kind of like, we want to re reply to everybody. And sometimes someone will leave a comment that's like, it might be a bit of a snidey comment with a bit of a bad vibe to it. But I think if you just immediately label them as a hater, then you can kind of turn them away. And it just kind of shows your own, um, you know, lack of development as an individual. Like, you know, if you can greet their comments with some degree of like, you know, not a big fucking ego reaction and, and just calmly like explain why they're wrong or whatever, then a lot of the times you can win these people over and they're like, oh, cool. I didn't know that, you know? Um, so that's, that's sometimes a good thing to do, but um it, it's it's kind of fun, you know, replying to to comments and just building that rapport with with the audience. And then we, we go out to a gig and we'll see people that we've, we've never met before, but we've had like 20 comment exchanges on, on the internet, you know, and we kind of know them from their profile picture or whatever. And it's like, oh, it's you. And it feels rewarding to do that as opposed to like, you know, a lot of bands that don't really engage with their audience. And I don't feel like, I feel like that, like, not only are the fans missing out, but the fans missing out as well on just that kind of fucking connection, you know? A hundred percent, man. Uh, that's what's great about social media. Like the, the one good thing is like, you can actually connect with a fan base and like grow it organically and really like, just be able to talk to people where before yeah. where the band, there was this massive wall between the audience and the fans, unless you bought like a, Five hundred dollar VIP pass or something, you know. Yeah, now you can talk to them directly. It's really it's, cool. It's something that that we've always tried to do. I recently we've, we've got a lot better at doing it. Just the whole, you know, re replying to fans and stuff like that. And I mean, since the start of this year, we've been posting a video every single day. So we we just kind of, you know, we've been through a couple of lineup changes this year and stuff like that. So there was a fair bit of what would normally be like a band's downtime was our time to like, you know, sink our teeth into like making content and stuff like that. And then naturally, like as a result of that, you'll reply to certain comments with a video, you know, which is always a good one as well, because it's like, it feels like, um, you know, I get a lot of people asking me like, how the fuck don't you run out of ideas? Or when do you like, are you sure you're going to be able to keep this up? I'm like, yeah, because it kind of feeds itself after a while. We're just at a point now where it, we're just off and rolling with it, you know. So it seems to be working pretty well. Hell yeah, man. Really cool to hear. Uh, the new album is very exciting. Cannot wait to uh, hear it. You guys are probably thinking about future tour dates and future just dates in general. Yeah. Are there any dates or, or any like uh, venues or places you have not played live yet that are like on your bucket list? Yeah, there's, there's definitely, I would say more so than than a bucket list they're on my fucking to-do list and i will get around to fucking doing them you know um i visualize every day you know stepping out on the main stage at, at download festival here at the uk you know hell yeah because that's a festival i've always gone to you know and so like being a kid like you know 14 15 years old going and seeing that stage and, and going and see some of my favorite bands play that stage um and it, it's i've always been someone who's been quite good at like visualizing a goal um, and, and just kind of plotting out the steps and, and not, I really just believe it's possible, you know, call me delusional. A lot of people do, but um, just kind of having that belief that you can fucking do it. And so I visualize Assenville on that stage every fucking day, you know, and, and that's at the moment, it's like, that's, that seems like the next goal that the big goal, you know, the next kind of big goal that, we, that I want us to attain. And then we'll take it from there, you know, but, it's like, you know, you got to believe in yourself. Otherwise, I guess, why are you doing it? You know, it's like, well, unless you just want to play like a on a, on a certain circuit and you enjoy that and and you don't want to grow and you don't want to do certain things. And that's cool, too, you know. But for someone like me who really fucking wants to, um, quote unquote, make it, that's my idea of making it is doing that. And, I, and I'm like, yeah, we're going to do it, you know. Yeah, and I I totally believe you guys will, and and that's why I even am doing this interview because you guys popped up on my feed, and I really just right. went down that rabbit hole, you know. And I feel yeah. like you guys are just growing so much, and with this new release, 
I think it's going to be really awesome uh, to see how fans react to it. Um, the new era of the band, as you were saying, with like yeah, World this is it. No. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, think, I feel like everything that's gone before has been um, been just leading up to this. This is the fucking definitive album, if you like. And you know, we've we've got all the demos sorted out for the um, for the new album, and there's there's not a single bad track on it. They're they're all like. We, we tried to write it as if every fucking song was a single. You know, like, there's, there's there's a couple of tracks that are a bit more interesting that you probably wouldn't put out as a single because it's like, okay, there's you know, this is structured. This is like four minutes long because it's got a bit of an outro on it or whatever. Um, but every single song on there has got you, you know, your rock and roll fucking hooks that you, you can imagine... And this is kind of where the visualization comes into it again. It's like you're visualizing these songs being played at fucking download festival. And like, oh, this is the bit where the crowd's going to like chant along. And it kind of just infusing that belief into your song. Like this is that fucking section, you know? And it's the first time we've ever done that is kind of write the songs with, with that stage show in mind. And like, I guess the more we've been touring and the more like the audience has been responding to us because we've actually like got our shit together now we're like we, we've gone from just like playing songs at the audience to having songs now that are a thing with the fucking audience you know and you go ah this is this is quite clearly that section it drops down there's some drums come on everybody you know and you kind of got that now we never fucking had that it was just bah you know have some noise and i, I feel like that's good and that's that's really what stands out about this album to me is that you really think I want to see this band live when you hear the hear the songs, you know, which is which I'm I'm pretty proud of the the way we got the song sounding. So yeah, it should be good. Very exciting, man. How how long has this record been in the works? Well, we um we sat down with we got a new booking agent about maybe two two months ago, something like that, with Marshall Records. Um, or Marshall Live Agency, like some subsidiary of, of Marshall. Um, and they asked us what our like two year plan was. And we had this like in the back of our mind, oh, we're going to do an album. But of course, we had a lineup change, like, um, you know, Ryan and Stell joined the band in like June. Um, and all up before that, we're like, oh, well, when we finally like get a stable lineup, we'll think about doing an album. But it was just nothing more than that, really. So, when we got the new the new lineup and Marshall approached us, they asked us, well, what's your plan? And we were like, oh, well, we don't want to tell them that like, oh, we'll, we'll record an album next year sometime. We're like, fuck it, let's just tell them we're going to record the album at the end of the year. How many songs have you got? Well, like five, you know, and we've got 14 now. So um, I would say there was probably a couple of ideas that, that existed before, Um but the majority of this album has been written in what, like the past three months. Um, wow. And if it, it feels like when we did Louder and Louder, that song came about in the space of an afternoon, the whole thing. <laughs> like, I remember we had the initial riff and then it was, oh, we need like some kind of, we had a bit of a chorus, but it didn't go to the kind of big heights that you want. Um, and just the day before we'd been just playing around and we'd done like the, I think it's a very similar chord sequence to like, well, probably every fucking rock and roll song under the sun, you know, what, how does it go? It's D G A, you know, that kind of thing. Um, AC DC chords. And we just sort of tapped that um, chorus onto the riff and we're like, Oh, this works. Brilliant. Uh, okay. Riff chorus, riff chorus, blah, blah, blah. Do a little fucking middle eight section, uh, write some lyrics. Uh, oh, we've got a title. Then he goes, oh, what about Louder and Louder? And at first I was like, that sounds so stupid. I, I Fuck off, you know? <laughs> if your initial reaction is that it sounds fucking stupid, maybe if you switch your brain off just enough, which is just as much as you would be at like a rock and roll show in the crowd going, Larry, you know, you don't want anything coming at you with like high intellect or something you have to think about too much. It's like, Louder and louder, you know, it's one word sang twice. Like whatever country of the world you're in, you're going to sing along to that. And I was like, okay, 
so a lot of these ideas are kind of like too dumb to to be true you know and um, we go with them anyway and that's kind of it, it makes the process quite easy because we're thinking about it less and less and then you know you come to a point where you kind of all right you've had that afternoon of kind of having that song being put together and then maybe for like the next week uh, before you go and record it you're just coming back to certain things and and then you're applying the the kind of thought and the rational mindset but I think if you can do the majority of the work without fucking engaging the logical part of your brain and just feeling it, you know, that's what we've been doing. And it, and it, it just feels great because the stuff we're coming out with is like when, you know, when you hear a really, really stupid song, that's just so catchy and you think you, you're almost annoyed at the person who wrote it because you're like, how are they getting away with that, man? I'm here with my technical, you know, like insane actual talent and, and then you realize that, well, maybe it is a talent to be that stupid. I, mean, I won't go that far, but um, there's something to it, you know? Yeah. Just kind of leaning into that primal instinct. That's what rock and roll is. It's it's not, if you listen to all the, the fucking old rock and roll songs, they all sound the fucking same. They're all using the same, the same notes, but it's injecting some kind of primal. You listen to little Richard, he's just screaming his head off. And it makes you feel like, oh, fucking hell, like it's like caffeine for your ears, you know? That's what we yeah. try and do. So, yeah. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, five or 10 beers in, you still remember louder and louder, I feel. Mm. <laughs> so that is smart. Um, what, how do you guys handle uh, like alcohol and just general, uh, you know, other brain altering substances? So like, are you guys a mainly sober band? Do you drink sometimes? Like, what is your relationship? Well, Lenny's been alcohol? sober for... I think since around the time I was born, I'm his third child, third and last. You know, he sort of perfected it with me and decided he, he could stop there. Um, <laughs> so around the time I was born, he he got sober. He used to be like drinking, you know, really fucking strong booze, like a special brew and smoking a pack of Marlboro Reds a day, you know, and um, just really heavy on it. And then he just cut it out cold turkey in one day. And never went back. He's been sober for like what twenty seven years now, or however long. Um, and I was drinking a little bit, like up until a couple of years ago, um, but never on tour. So would be, um, you know, doing a tour, and I'd come back to England or, or whatever, and go and see my see my friends over in Leeds, so which is just next to where I'm from in Harrogate. A uh, big city, you know, go out, have a few drinks, see your friends again. And it's like, oh, this is great, you know. Um, and then I'd go out on tour and I'd be completely sober. And the, the more the more we were touring, it just kind of felt like I've just there's just a small amount of my time now that I'm spending drinking, which isn't really doing me any good. And and because I'm getting, you know, most of my socializing, I'm doing sober anyway. I, I don't really get much out of being drunk. It's just kind of like a uh, hindrance you know um so I, I knocked it on the head maybe a little less than two years ago now um so i don't drink and smoke and, and lenny doesn't drink and smoke i'm pretty sure stell like barely ever drinks uh and we've certainly got like it's not necessarily a rule but it, it's just a, a common sense i think for the kind of show that we're putting on is that we just don't really drink um anywhere near the band because we we're trying to do something that's fundamentally quite athletic. Um, if we if we play on like a big stage, and like I was saying earlier about like, you know, that visualization of playing Download Festival, you know, when we play Download Festival, we are going to be all over that fucking stage because I see bands playing it. And sometimes I'm stood there and I'm thinking like, fuck me, I would be all over that fucking shit. But it's easier said than done because like it's a lot of fucking work. You know, I'm at the gym every single morning, like running 5K on the treadmill, trying to like get that stamina up because I know that that day's coming. And yeah. uh, so, so to drink just feels like it's just taking me one step further away from that vision and that kind of goal that I'm in mind. And I feel like we're all on that same page of like, you know, we're, we're, we're doing this for real. We know how hard it is. We know that nobody ever fucking makes it. We know that if we're going to be the ones that make it, then we be, we've got to do something different and you know there's not a lot of bands i don't think that that kind of stay sober and and just um you know raw dog it so here we are you know 
just just yeah. another thing to um to help us you know get that edge i suppose very healthy man and that's definitely the smartest thing you can do <laughs> especially you see bands drop so young because of it and yeah. it's completely ruined so many bands in the past so it's like good to just keep yourselves mentally and physically healthy um and especially yeah man i'll, I'll see these giant festivals and the band they're just they're standing in place you know it's like you guys yeah. realize you have this whole big area to put on a show you know to all these people but i guess That's it's just I, the rehearsal room <laughs> yeah I, I feel like you know when you've when you've kind of been in that situation of oh going consistently to these like big festivals and stuff and and you know just yearning for that opportunity that it's like when you when you finally get that opportunity it, it's um i mean we played a, a show support in wolf mother a couple months ago and that was just um andrew had seen one of our videos on on tiktok or wherever and yeah uh, when when they asked oh what support band do you want he was like oh how about these guys you know um and so, you know, that was quite handy. But having that opportunity after, like, even just a couple of weeks before, I was at, a, like, an Airborne concert um, at, like, a similar-sized O2 venue and just thinking, like, fuck, like, what I wouldn't give to just be on that stage, you know, and have that opportunity. So going through that, like, being starved of it a little bit, and then you finally get the opportunity, it's like, well, I'm not going to fucking waste it now. I'm going to give it everything I fucking got to prove that I deserve it because it'll get taken away straight away. If you don't, you know, it's like, yeah. you gotta, you gotta kind of earn your stripes and it, it feels, um, it feels really rewarding when you finally just get that tiny little nugget of, of something. It's like, ah, we were on the right track, man. We can do it. You know, it's, it's all going to work out. Yeah, man, a hundred percent. And amazing to hear this has been a really awesome conversation i really appreciate you coming on the show man oh nice uh, one man yeah born to rock and roll out march 2024 very very exciting uh oh, yeah appreciate you being on man looking forward nice, to, the new release. to chat man nice one yeah man i'm brandon baddick and this is disturbing the priest <laughs> <laughs>